Good luck. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to give uh, one or two minutes for the attendees to join, uh, but we're going to start the webinar in like uh, one minute once we have um, you know, the, all the attendees uh, on board. Okay, I don't want to delay too much, so I think uh, we'll get started. And uh, I'm Rafael Carmona, I'm with the ICDR. I just want to uh, take one minute to make a very brief introduction. First of all, uh, thank you all for attending this webinar that we hope you will find uh, interesting and entertaining. And I want to also take a moment to thank uh, Imad Khan, uh, George Fasfalis, and uh, Laura Zimmerman uh, from our uh, ICDR Young and International Group for helping organize this webinar, uh, as well as, of course, all of our panelists uh, for participating. Uh, just very quickly, if you want to join, if you're not registered as a YNI associate, uh, you can go to our website. Uh, if you look for ICDR YNI, uh, you'll find us immediately and you can see there that we have some registration form to join and you'll be able to see also uh, some of our past webinars that we've recorded and uploaded there. Um, so you'll be able to access them even if you couldn't attend uh, when they took place. And uh, you know, if you don't even have time to uh, register, you know, fill in a form, like I know we're all busy, just go to LinkedIn, join our LinkedIn group. Uh, if you type ICDRY, uh, you'll be already able to see it. And uh, you know, we'll always post also any update about our events there. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll introduce, first of all, our moderators are going to be Mark Cantor. He's an independent arbitrator in DC. And we also have Patricia Shaughnessy. Uh, she's a professor at Stockholm University. And uh, for the, pan the, the actual uh, speakers defending the propositions, so we have uh, in favor of the propositions, uh, Jonathan Lim from Wilmer Hale. Uh, we have uh, Meredith Craven from White and Case in Houston. We have Claudia Taveras from Arnold Porter in New York. For the opposition team, we have Eric Van Eiken with Clyde & Co. in Montreal, Yulia Kupchenko from Phil Fisher, London, and uh, Francisco Franco from Baker McKenzie in uh, Mexico City. So I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, debate. And uh, with that, I leave the floor to our uh, moderators, Mark Hunter and Patricia. So Mark, Patricia, uh, you can take it from here. Thank you. Trisha, your mute's on. Patricia, you're muted. You don't want to have a cyber meeting, is that right, Green? So uh, today we're going to start with the first debate. And on the first debate, we're going to have the proposition team arguing that the these cyber virtual hearings should be the exception and not the norm. We're going to invite our proponents to give a very short opening statement. It'll be about three, maybe three and a half minutes. And then we'll invite the opponents to make their opening statement. And after that, I'm going to invite all of you, the participants, to a poll. So let's start with the opening statements of the proponents. And Go ahead. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, hi. Um, well, well, since we're since we're timing, I'll just set my timer quickly. I'm Meredith Craven from Widen Case, and I am here representing the proposition team. As we all know, and as many of us have experienced firsthand, the global health crisis has popularized virtual hearings and rendered them a necessity in many arbitrations. Nonetheless, as the proposition team will demonstrate, for all their utility during this unprecedented time, virtual hearings remain the next best thing 
and far inferior to the best option, a traditional physical hearing. To understand why virtual hearings are inferior to physical hearings, it's important to analyze and refute some of the purported benefits of virtual hearings. First, cost. Proponents of virtual hearings often argue that they make proceedings more cost efficient by cutting out travel and accommodation costs of a hearing. However, as we all know, these are not the most expensive parts of a hearing. Second, proponents often say that virtual hearings make uh, hearings shorter. In fact, virtual hearings often take longer because time zone differences and our shorter attention span when watching a human on a screen as opposed to in real life force shorter hearing, uh, hearing days. Finally, many proponents argue that virtual hearings create flexibility in scheduling, allowing for uh, compensation for busy calendars and avoiding delays in hearings. However, having a physical hearing date on the calendar is often key leverage to keep parties from extending the procedural calendar. Thus, by introducing greater flexibility, virtual hearings may inevitably cause greater delays. In contrast to these questionable gains, parties and indeed the practice of arbitration actually lose a lot when we transition from physical hearings to virtual. From the standpoint of individuals, parties lose a great degree of the representation and process that they expect, including compromising communication, equality of arms, and ethics controls. At best, these compromise the party's sense of legitimacy of the, of the hearing proceeding, and at worst, they could compromise the enforceability of the award. Finally, virtual hearings not only compromise individual arbitration proceedings, but if used widely, they could have serious detriment on arbitration practice as a whole. One prescient example of this for our ICDR YNI audience is that virtual hearings raise serious problems for diversity and the future of arbitration. Given the more challenging nature of a virtual hearing, which we'll discuss further in the open debate session of this debate, senior lawyers may be reluctant to give their subordinates the opportunity to question witnesses or even deliver arguments. This is particularly true when senior lawyers cannot be in the same room as the more junior lawyer to coach him or her. Finally, the fact that virtual hearing days tend to be shorter contributes to this diversity issue. Many of us had our first opportunity to take an active role in a hearing because a more senior lawyer simply did not have time to prepare for all aspects of the hearing on a particular day. So we got a small cross in the afternoon so that the more senior lawyer could prepare for a more substantial cross in the morning. Young lawyers lose out on these important opportunities to develop their skills and gain experience when hearing days are more spread out because of the virtual nature. In conclusion, while virtual hearings are necessary now, and are certainly better than telephonic hearings or indefinite stays of proceedings, they are not adequate substitutes for physical hearings. In, in the post-COVID world, they should be used only in exceptional circumstances where it is not possible to have a physical hearing. Well, I suspect the opponents are ready to jump all over you. Who's going? I am. <laughs> Go for it, Leah. Yeah, from Phil Fisher London. Um, the circumstances of the lockdown are unique and present very unique challenges, but we have to think about the world after the lockdown, when lo normal life resumes and we can learn from this experience. Those of us who've had the pleasure of experiencing virtual hearings um, firsthand realize that they're not as terrible as the other team will have us believe. With the benefit of practice and training, virtual hearings can easily replace most in-person hearings and save parties time and money in the process. One of the main benefits of virtual hearings, as we've just heard, is their flexibility. It is much easier to accommodate hearing dates in the tribunal and the party's diaries when you only need to consider the actual hearing dates and the additional travel days. Fixing a hearing sooner will result in swifter resolution of arbitrations. For longer hearings, it is possible to split them up into multiple parts, making it easier to fit again in tribunal party's diaries. This is easily possible to do virtual hearings and very costly to do in in-person hearings. This is why the virtual hearings are of particular benefit for bifurcated proceedings. Once virtual hearings become more common and we get over the initial investment into the hardware, the software, the training, the cost savings will be significant. Yes, we will eliminate travel, accommodation, venue, Costs. They are not the most significant costs of a hearing, but they are significant and they can be reduced by virtual hearings. The only cost of virtual hearings will be 
technology, virtual technology, will become even cheaper the more we use it in the future. And of course, reducing our work-related travel will only have a positive impact on the environment. And we all know how important it is to keep our carbon footprint down. Opponents of virtual hearing will argue that only an in-person hearing is suitable for witnesses and cross-examination of experts. This is an outdated view. Witnesses give evidence by VC fairly commonly in normal in-person hearings. I'm sure most of the panelists have been involved in in-person hearings where one or more witnesses have had to give evidence by VC. We all adapt. There's no reason why cross-examination by VC cannot be as effective as in person. Any genuine factors about witness coaching or tampering can be alleviated with very simple measures. The other team will try to convince you that in-person hearings are the gold standard and nothing else will do, but their real objective is to preserve their opportunity to travel across the globe at their client's expense and charge additional fees for the unnecessary additional time that in-person hearings take but we all must respect and adhere to arbitration rules, most of which require arbitrations to be conducted expediously and cost-effectively. Any virtual hearing will achieve that. Thank you. So with that, dear audience, you now have an opportunity in the poll to be able to indicate where, at this point whether you agree or disagree that virtual hearings should remain the exception rather than the norm. So with that, I've launched your polling and I ask everyone to please, oh, got the first couple of votes, up oh, five agree. Oh, 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 wow, they're coming in quickly. Agree still leading. Disagree is coming up. It's like a horse race. I don't know, disagrees are gonna have to speed up if they're gonna try to overtake agree. You guys were convincing. Okay, we got about another 30 seconds for you to vote. If you wanna to try to beat the agree, then you're gonna to have to be quick on your poll. Okay, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Sixty 2, 1. 60% agree. How did we get such a round number? 40% disagree. So with that, Let's the debate start and let's see if our talented young and international advocates will be able to change your opinion in the next 15 minutes or so. So who's taking a bite out of what Yulia just said? Patricia, I think I can um, start us off. So one of the more um, emphasized advantages uh, that the opposition team uh, has um, listed is the flexibility of the hearings and the potential reduction in costs. As my colleague in the proposition team um, indicated in the opening, the Reduction in costs that comes from virtual hearings is not really um, as significant as one would expect. Uh, no, uh, attorneys and law firms do not want to bill clients to fly and travel abroad and stay in expensive hotels. Attorneys want to be able to um, collect. Oh, Claudia, Claudia, tell me, how many loyalty points do you get at your favorite hotel chain every year? And how many times have you upgraded a flight or taken a vacation off the travel that you've done by going to some hearing or CMC? I don't think the important thing here is the points. I think the important thing here is the ability to collaborate with the team. Oh in no, the Claudia. Advantage. Don't don't try and avoid the question, Claudia. Answer it directly. Come now, the, answer the, Patricia's question. Don't Unfortunately, Mark and Patricia, I don't have an answer because I don't know what the loyalty programs are at my firm. Um, oh, but jo Jonathan, does that mean that Claudia has just conceded the entire argument? Are you simply going to declare victory and walk? 
Uh, no, she hasn't. She doesn't even know what a loyalty program is at her firm. She doesn't use it. That's not a reason we want hearings. We want hearings because they're fairer and they provide due process to parties. Well, put some meat on that bare bone due process argument. Well, we all know, we all know that, you know, we've always been able to have documents only hearings, but we don't do them. There is, there's a reason to that. And, and many countries have an actual wait, wait, wait. I don't think hearing. I don't think that Meredith's the, or, sorry I don't think that Yulia was suggesting that it should be documents only no but um I'm trying to say that there's something we value in face-to-face -face interaction and if you start there then we ask the question do virtual hearings give us as good face-to-face -face interaction as in-person hearings and I think the answer is surely not I think most of us know that most of communication takes place not because of the words that we say, but because of things like what we don't say, what the tone of a voice says, a body language, me touching my ears, looking kind of shifty right now, all those kinds of, of nonverbal com communication. <laughs> exactly, but you couldn't tell. Get a, get a bigger screen, get a bigger screen, and you can see them 10 times bigger than life. I look much shiftier in real life. Oh, Francisco, case. I think that Jonathan has just handed you a gimme. Is it at all persuasive that arbitrators and counsel can really read body language? Every psychological study I've ever read said that is, in technical terms, baloney. Come now, it Francisco. Is. It is oh. baloney, indeed. You can, I mean, you can do it, you can also do it in, on the screen. There's no big difference. I mean, we, we read body language on the screen every time when we the, for example, a news anchor on CNN calling out some Republican senator, we can see their demeanor clear, clearly. So I, I don't think it makes a difference whether it's in person or in, or, or in video. Oh, so you think that U.S. politicians are good actors? You may be the only one who believes that. Meredith, that's a handover. I'm going <laughs> I'm to save Francisco from having to answer um, his question about his opinion on American politicians, because that seems like the toughest question of the day. Um, and just say, I think that a really important example to look at as to why um, body language is actually important um, is our current choice of virtual hearings over telephonic hearings. We've done telephonic hearings, for example, CMCs and procedural conferences for years when we feel like it's not um, feasible to get everyone together. But when the coronavirus came and people were not able to travel, period, we didn't go to telephonic hearings. We looked for something that gave us some sort of connection to um, that 93% of communication that's nonverbal, that physical um, body language, tone of voice, and facial expression. And so it's clear from the way that we've expressed our preferences now that we as a practice really do have a preference for that additional level of communication. Yes, we but have we achieved it now. By, by video, we can see you, your facial expressions, we can hear you and your tone of voice. You can see my hand gestures right in front of me. Um, we have all that by video. Well, I we do, but we don't have it, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to address a question from Albert Goldson on our Q&A already. And that is, what about the time and expense pressures of travel and in-person meetings strongly favoring those who are exceptionally well-funded? Wouldn't That's virtual good... meetings level the pay playing field and be more equi equitable? That's a good question. Um, in some ways, uh, there is an increased equity in that, you know, for example, uh, some council are able to, uh, you know, travel first class around the world on their client's dime and others maybe are not, maybe have greater difficulty traveling. Um, however, you can't, um, the inequities um, will exist regardless of the platform on which you're operating. And in fact, there may be greater inequities associated with virtual hearings. What do I mean by that? Virtual hearings um, put us all at the mercy of what technology is available to us. And so what you'll find is that some entities have access to better technology, um, better wait, software. Wait, 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 wait. I'm, going to, I'm going to invite Eric to, to tell us, do we have such an even playing field today? I mean, is it that every party comes to an arbitration equally resourced? Is it some obligation of the system to make sure everybody has the same competence, lawyers and experts and funding and get a third party funder, Eric? And of, of course not. 
right, right now we know that in-person hearings are definitely not equal. Um, if you're you know, able to afford um, that law firm, which can staff the file with 15, 20 lawyers on it, that's going to give an advantage. Um, virtual hearings allow both sides to potentially add more people to the team at far less cost in terms of travel uh, and, and similar. And, and allow people um, to build bigger teams. And the idea that somehow, you know, people won't be able to afford the technology. Every laptop these days, every cell phone comes with a video camera. Um, internet connections are, are available around the globe. Um, th there's simply no actual technological hurdle here. And I think we saw that at this year's Vismood where we had participants uh, joining in from all over the place. Oh, Eric, how much you overestimate the skills with technology of the arbitrators, many of whom still use Gmail email accounts and rely on a single computer that could have been bought by your grandmother. I mean, surely someone on the green side can correct Eric's mistakes here. Johnny? Tell Eric no, why so, he's wrong, or do you agree well, with him? <laughs> most, most arbitrators are very proficient in technology, but we all know we all know that that everyone has their limitations, and I think for Eric's Eric's um, argument assumes um, that a certain level of technology exists for everybody. But we're all familiar with that client who even you know relies on a power generator um, and and has intermittent power supply. I think. I think, frankly, the opposition's argument has assumptions that are very Euro and American centric. I think we need to make sure that the system works for everybody. Arbitrators in countries which require power generators to operate the internet and arbitrators in, in London and in Paris, the system has to work for everybody. So you're saying that clients ought to be permitted to engage counsel who have inadequate technology, inadequate technological experience, and inadequate equipment, and that it's the responsibility of institutions, arbitrators, and opposing counsel to equalize those circumstances? Isn't that a bit of a fantasy world, Jonathan? No, we're not saying that there's a burden on institutions to equalize that, but I think going back to the technology we're discussing, um, virtual hearings, I think we should be conscious where, it, where technology exacerbates. I think we all seem to recognize there already is a problem of equality of arms, a technology that exacerbates that problem, I think we, we would say is inferior to the technology we do have, which is in-person hearings. Oh, one, of, one of our uh, participants, Annette Kielman, she wonders if, how, what, what happens with fraud and witness examinations? What happens in the context of a virtual hearing? Isn't it opening the door to greater fraud and greater problems? Yeah, that's precisely one of the issues that we've identified. There is one more um, room for questionably, ethically questionable behavior, and also more room for obstructive practices uh, to impede effective cross-examination. Um, yes, there are um, hardwares that technically permit you to see the environment where the witness is seated, but you can't see everything. Ultimately, we are relying on trust and sometimes people abuse that trust. I just interject. When there's a genuine fear that someone may be tampering with a witness, we can always send a representative from each side to sit in a room with that witness. That travel cost will still be less than the whole two teams traveling to, the, to one location. Because we're talking about a world after lockdown that we will be allowed to travel. We're just choosing not to limit it to the minimum. So sending a representative over to be with the witness will just alleviate that concern. Let so your argument, somebody your argument, Yulia, then says that we don't have to worry about this uh, until after COVID, two years from now, perhaps. So how is that persuasive to this audience? What you're saying then is we have to live with the fraud risk because we can't send people over to sit in the room with a witness for possibly up to two years. If we're going to send people over to sit in a room, why don't we just all sit in the same room? 
because it'll be less number of people flying out to one location. And if we can't uh, travel there, for example, one of the team lawyers, you can always find a lawyer within the relevant jurisdiction, an independent lawyer who will sit in the room with that witness. Well, I think it the, seems to me. One of the questions that has been asked in the Q&A is, aren't you also saving quite a lot of time and effort and people will not be tired from traveling they won't be jet lagged you'll be able to all work more effectively i think eric you had a great point about this i think, I think that's exactly it and and we talk about modernizing the profession we talk about making sure there's better work-life balance and making sure there's greater diversity i think my colleagues op opposite said well, you get that greater diversity by being able to say, yes, we can have counsel participating who have children at home, who have family obligations towards parents or friends, who have pets to be taken care of. Um, we can have those shorter days. We can increase the focus uh, on the case during that small amount of the virtual hearing uh, that the day is dedicated to and, and be rested, not have that burden of, of jet lag not have the disaster that comes from having that witness who flew in the day before because they want to save money and is jet lagged and looks incoherent, but actually is quite credible, but has simply been forced to, to look bad because of the challenges of in-person hearing. So Eric, you can solve that problem by arriving a day early. Moreover, it seems to me that you are assuming that your clients care about your work-life balance. I had a few decades as a practicing lawyer. I don't recall any of my clients giving a hoot about my work-life balance. Do you have that kind of client? If so, I'd love to know the name. Aspirational future. Our performance. Uh -huh. Meredith, do you have clients like that? Sadly, no. Um, actually, another um, issue with virtual hearings is I currently have a lawnmower going by to my right hand side. So um, if you have trouble hearing me, please um, raise a hand and I'll pass to one of my uh, to one of my colleagues. Um, but uh, I, I think that um, assuming that having uh, more convenient, not, not having to leave your home or potentially not having to leave your home city um, creates a better, more focused hearing is really a fallacy. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of us who have done hearings in our hometown versus hearings where we travel, I think we can all um, agree that you focus significantly more when you have an opportunity to go together with your team uh, to a location and work strictly on one dispute as opposed to staying home and being distracted by all of the various things that, um, you know, that frequently impact your daily life. So I'm not sure that that argument really holds water. Francisco, you buy that? No, you still have the exhaustion of traveling in, in any event, even if the client doesn't care about her health, it's an issue for performance, right? I think uh, being, being well rested and staying at home would actually increase our performance during the hearing. And even if you're in a different state or different city, you still get interruptions from your emails. So your other work doesn't leave you in peace. What about, what about the argument, Yulia, about diversity that Meredith made? Um, I'm assuming that you're all in favor of diversity, that younger lawyers, Y and I, uh, the people in that club, are all interested in getting proper mentorship. They all want to get opportunities to test. Do you buy Meredith's argument that the opportunity to take part in the hearing, to learn from a senior, accomplished lawyer is virtually reduced in the virtual space. Absolutely the opposite. On our team, we discussed how virtual hearings allow junior members to participate in a hearing without the cost of traveling. Normally, um, uh, legal teams consider reducing their teams to what is absolutely necessary when we travel to uh, not have the unnecessary costs. But if you're joining in from your office, you can have lots of your junior members joining in and. Um, um, simply just sitting in, which they wouldn't be able to do in a hearing in a different country. Whether you have the opportunity to cross-examine or not. So, uh, which so you have no problem with having clients pay for that? Yulia, uh, you have no problem with having clients pay for that? All of those lawyers sitting in, listening and learning on the wallet of a client? That's no, 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 no. Way to you don't have that. to charge. You, you, there's no, uh, there's no need to charge for those lawyers sitting in. It could be an, an, uh, a free experience, a learning curve. 
but it's something that an opportunity that you cannot have if the oh, hearing. Oh, oh really? You're obviously. So you're obviously not familiar with partners like I used to be who care about whether or not their associates are charging their time or running up hours for which nobody is paying. I seem to recall that uh, not only did I care about it, but the partners who kept track of my realization rate cared a great deal about the effectiveness of my team. Come now, that's not a realistic attitude, is it? Claudia, don't you? Yes, and it seems like the opposition side is setting up a stage where the um, counterparty has an attorney present with the witness, where all the attorneys are present in the same room, where everybody's collaborating together, except the only problem is that they can't be in the same city. So we again insist the actual cost of the travel and being in the same city is far less than the loss in collaboration and the hidden costs of having everybody separate and not being able to work together as a team. Also, the alleged flexibility that you get um, can also come at a cost. Not everybody is in the same time zone. So yes, maybe someone travels and they might be jet lagged. But if I'm in Singapore, like Jonathan is, and my the other side is in New York, whatever time is picked to hold the hearings is going to be nighttime for one of us. So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do it you know often, that Jonathan is really in Singapore? <laughs> yeah. You know, it often you occurs. You have to send somebody. Uh, okay, John, Jonathan, I'm sure that you that you've experienced this. I'm sure all of you have that one party or its team of lawyers is located at the seat of arbitration and the other is located at Singapore or London or Canada or wherever and so are you saying the one that's actually there should have to sit at home on their laptop instead of actually be in front of the tribunal so one person's um, distance from the hearing should take us to the lowest rung possible I'm sorry, Patricia, nope. I don't follow. What if one, if you have the tribunal at the seat of arbitration, at least a couple members, and you have one party in their council team at the seat of arbitration? The other is someplace, the other group is far away. So are you saying that there should be a virtual hearing for everybody? Or could the party that doesn't want to travel appear by virtual and the others be live? Parties agree to do that, then that's fine. The parties are free to agree that. I'm sure most part, most parties would, would not, and in that case, the one party may have to insist on an in-person hearing, and those are the exceptional circumstances that we have to live with. But what we're arguing is that virtual hearings shouldn't be the exception. In-person hearings should be the exception, and there are though that is potentially an example of an exception. Okay, I'm going to give you guys two questions and then we're going to uh, stop this debate and take a poll and we're going to move to the next. We have two questions pending that are related. Carolina Morandi asks um, the questions about witnesses inquiries and virtual hearings about that council could send instructions to witnesses online or witnesses have prepared answers on their computers that they previously prepared and connected to that Santiago Rodriguez is asking wouldn't a virtual hearing, however, reduce or eliminate the subjectiveness and dramatic tactics that can be used in a live hearing to sway the tribunal, not on the basis of the facts, but on the basis of their drama? So, anyone? Takers? I well, think I'll on the first. The, the... Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Why don't you go ahead, Meredith? No, go ahead. I'll take the next point. Okay, it sounds like you were you were going to address the first point, so I'll address the second uh, with respect to drama. Um, I can tell you that um, I had a hearing at the beginning of uh, the coronavirus pandemic where we did the first half in person, and then we were all evacuated from the hearing zone, and we did the remainder um, by video conference from our respective homes. Um, and I can tell you that the level of drama brought by my opposing counsel was in no way uh, diminished um, by moving to a virtual hearing. Um, however, I think that it was um, certainly uh, less effective of a presentation tactic um, because uh, they had, you know, um, faulty internet access, 
um, you know, faulty uh, audio and all sorts of issues that I think made it more difficult to present their case uh, to the to the tribunal. And I think it's very important for us to remember that from a psychological standpoint, being able to see and understand better frequently, frequently translates into um, being more persuasive. And so the technological inequities that we find in a virtual hearing very often do translate into a due process issue where one party has a better connection and therefore is more persuasive, even if their case is not more persuasive. Um, on Carolina's point, I think that's absolutely spot on. I think there is guidance available on how you could try to reduce the risk of witness coaching, have 360 cameras, have witnesses show you their room. But who are we kidding? We're all relying on the good faith of the witness. How do we know there isn't a cell phone in the drawer somewhere sending text messages about what to say? I think we have to assume a lot about the good faith of individuals. To rule that out and I think Yulia concedes that there's no way to rule out that possibility without sending somebody to be beside that witness that illustrates by itself that that this is a risk that's impossible to eliminate unless we're all in person together so Thanks. Yulia Jonathan has just impugned your reputation for advocacy how do you respond to that well on the witness um, question um, I think it's pretty clear from um, from the video when a witness is being distracted by something, if they're pulling out a phone from a drawer or someone is whispering in their ear, I think we could read that from the body language. But yes, if there is a genuine concern, and I don't think that is very often that there is this concern, we, my solution is simple, send a representative. Or do a better cross-examination. Um, last question before we uh, start to wind down this debate. Considering that arbitrators usually deliberate right after the hearing, um, what do you think the impact is going to be of a virtual hearing when they're not able to, to engage in discussions during the process and deliberate directly after, at least initially? Is that is that the thing that would be the straw that breaks the camel's back on the virtual hearing, the inability of the arbitrators to interact efficiently? Um, I don't see a problem with um, uh, arbitrators not being able to deliberate together in another, um, in another Zoom or in another telephone call. Um, deliberation does not have to happen in person. They can all continue in a different virtual room. Julia, how do, you, how do you satisfy the problem of time zones then? When the arbitrators sitting in different time zones, some of them may be quite late or quite early when the time comes for deliberations. That's unlike the case in in-person hearings where you break at four, five, six, seven, depending on stamina, and then the arbitrators can deliberate promptly thereafter, usually over a good steak at a nice restaurant, uh, and then retreat to our fine hotels. Absolutely. That's why I'm an arbitrator, isn't it? In order to go to good hotels and eat fine meals. Everybody knows that's true. Not very sustainable of you. You should be eating something vegetarian and staying at home on your computer. Oh, we all sure. need to be environmentally friendly. Um, time zones is an issue. We recognize that. That it is a, a major drawback and is something that we have to live with and adapt to. Um, we just have to see the bigger uh, positives of virtual hearings and I accept the negatives and work around them. And then your argument then is just suck it up. I mean, come on, green team, you've got an answer for that, don't you? I'll, I'll uh, take this unless one of my colleagues would like to, to jump in. Um, I think that um, the inefficiencies or time zone issues, et cetera, of tribunal deliberations following a virtual hearing are problematic, but in fact, potentially the most problematic issue with virtual deliberations is, well, wouldn't we all love to know what the arbitrators are saying after the hearing? And when we have virtual deliberations for some unethical parties, there is in fact a way to find out what tribunals are saying during their deliberations following the hearing. Uh -huh. Sounds and like so this, this is the next debate topic getting introduced, cybersecurity. This potentially exactly ties into our next topic so i don't want to get ahead of myself but i think that there are some very serious cybersecurity issues associated with 
transitioning to virtual hearing and, of course, and there having aren't these any deliberations. issues with real hearings of course that we've never seen that happen one last thing um, one of the attendees has asked about the views of translations and in in virtual hearings i had a disastrous zoom meeting this morning with um, attempts at having contemporaneous translation um, it was 45 minutes of gibberish before we decided to go to consecutive and then it, it broke down quite a lot with the consecutive and questions isn't that really a problem in international arbitration you know, time zones plus translations, you add all this together. Doesn't that just really pull the rug out from under the argument? Yes, that's that's part of the difficulties that we've um, identified. Um, if you have simultaneous translations or translations in general, you're gonna have to have more hardware. If you have to mobilize that hardware to witnesses that may not be able to travel for whatever reason, and that's extra cost. Um, and translation depends a lot on visual cues. Um, you were mentioning the consecutive translation. For consecutive translations to work, the translator has to know when the person's gonna make a pause and then make the translation. It's virtually impracticable to do that when you are not physically present. Although we can easily have, and perhaps more easily have, translators found at the witness's physical location. Have them in the room with the witness and provide that translation from that witness location. Um, Eric, I've seen enough disagreements about who the translator is to <laughs> suspect that opposing counsel may be very uncomfortable with the idea of having a local translator translating on behalf of a local witness um, without a Czech translator also in the location or elsewhere. And then you have two translators and that doubles the problems with technology, doesn't it? I think if we're getting into, into issues of the translator uh, mistranslating, thankfully or hopefully somebody on counsel's side will, will speak the language, will be able to intervene and that can be fixed um, on the transcript or afterwards. We have Giorgio recommending that we might consider a middle ground about using combinations of virtual and in-person by having large rooms with social distancing and I guess we could be wearing PPE and plastic masks and having some kind of um, post uh, uh, stay at home but not yet back to the real world. I think we could discuss this and debate this on and on but I think we now need to segue into the closing statements and then going to the poll to see whether or not anyone change their mind before we go into the cybersecurity. So may I invite closing statements? This is Johnny for the proposition. We basically heard from the opposition that in the pandemic with constrained air travel and limitations on movements of persons where an in-person hearing is not possible in the foreseeable future, that virtual hearings are okay that they're not as terrible as people think. That's because they're better than the next best alternative, which is indefinite postponement of an in-person hearing in an evolving pandemic that few of us fully understand. But leave aside those clearly exceptional circumstances. Let's put ourselves in a world where there aren't stay home orders, where there aren't the same restrictions in travel. If you have the option of both on the same day, both equally feasible, would you as counsel advise your client to take a virtual hearing? Would you as an arbitrator order a virtual hearing in all cases? Would you as an institution amending your rules be comfortable with a provision that says all hearings will be virtual unless exceptionally justified? That is what the opposition has to show to succeed. And we all know that is completely unrealistic. My colleagues have shown that the supposed cost and efficiency benefits of virtual hearings are often overstated. And we've heard even from our colleagues from the other side of the various problems, there are still works in progress in trying to be solved. I think we've heard that witness coaching is impossible to rule out without someone in person. Time zone issues continue to be a problem. And we all know that ensuring a level playing field becomes even more challenging when we add technological diversity into the mix. And we haven't even begun to talk about cybersecurity concerns. I rest my case. And may we hear from the red group? 
Yes, hi. Gonna be me. So, one thing that we never heard the proposition challenge is the benefits of the, uh, in the environment by not traveling to a hearing. Those are great benefits. We need to save the world. I mean, we're having this pandemic problem because we're not taking enough care about the world. That's one. Second, there's flexibility. We, we, we've all been in a hearing where we're just rushing to finish because we only have the hearing venue booked for a, for a week for World War II, right? And also, we, we, we have not considered all the, all the hurdles that we have to take care of before, before a hearing. So we have a witness and expert coming from a different place. All this, we need, to, we need to help them arrange their visas. We need to help them book a hotel. We need to find hotels. Maybe you have your, you have your hearing date, but it might move. So you have to make all these last minute changes to your travel schedule. And most importantly, although, as Mark said, the client might not care about your, our health, it is a fact that if we're re well rested, we're, our performance is gonna be better. And Johnny won't, will not let me lie, but this Professor Bourne has said that at a hearing, a virtual hearing is the same as a hearing because you're providing the parties an opportunity to state their case uh, live. So with that, I would like to close. Thank you. I'm going to relaunch the poll to see whether or not anyone changed their mind. So I invite everyone now, all the attendees, to now vote again. Wow. Oh, they agree or fast? But it's kind of okay. We're 63, 38, 62, 65, 35, 67, 30. Oh, disagree, you better get in there. Oh, we're back up to where we were. I think the agrees are faster to agree and the disagrees are pondering whether or not they should disagree. Okay, five seconds and we will close the poll. We have many who are not voting, so you still get a chance. Down to a couple of seconds. And we end the polling and we share the results. And you know what? It's exactly the same. So with that, um, thank you to our great debaters. I think they're now warmed up. And I think we're now going to bring the master moderator in to launch the cyber debate. Mark? Patricia, thank you for leading the moderation of the first question. Uh, it falls to me now to raise the second question. Uh, you will all recall, that is, whether arbitral institutions must do more to address cybersecurity risks in international arbitration. And once again, the green team remains the same, the proponents of the question, and the red team remains the same, the opponents to the question. And Patricia and I remain your typical pain in the tail gadflies, also known as moderators. Patricia, I wonder, would you care to poll the audience on this sec second question about arbitral institutions and cybersecurity? I sure do. So here we go. Arbitral institutions must do more to address cybersecurity risks in international arbitration. Please note the obligation would be on the arbitral institute. Agree or disagree? So we, it's now open for your voting. Wow, so far everybody wants to put the responsibility on the tribe arbitral institutes. Uh, disagrees are starting to come in. Um, I would say based upon this scientific study that people are quicker to agree with a proposition than to disagree. Hmm? So Patricia, okay. would you care to do the countdown? Yeah, we're gonna do the countdown. You got uh, six seconds to vote. Hurry up and vote. You now have about two seconds to vote and I will end the polling. And we end the polling and here are the results. Hmm? Wow. I, I think the representatives of the ICDR <laughs> among the attendees may be quivering in their boots just a little bit, as yeah. is our co-host, Raphael. Yeah, you guys better start upping your budget on uh, changing your rules. And uh, this could be a new competitive edge for some arbitration institutes. Go at it, proponents. OK, I want to hear opening statements. Let's hear them from the green team first and then the red team. Who will speak for the green? I will. 
You know, before you begin, Jonathan, I just know people have been asking the question online um, in other forms. Why is it we all feel the need to lift our hand on virtual hearings, but not in in-person hearings, exactly like you did? You might consider that and answer that in the chat session. But why don't you proceed with opening statement? That, that's an interesting question, Mark. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer, but that felt most instinctive at the moment. The, let me open for the green team. We're all aware that the increasing digitalization of information, how it's conveyed, how it's stored, comes with risks. Um, cybersecurity risks are essentially the risks that there could be unintended or unauthorized access, changing or destruction of data on platforms and computers and um, on networks. Um, I've just switched my audio provider, so if I'm not clear, um, let me know. I've just had to switch off instead of headphones. But if you can hear me, could I get a hands up? Great. So the motion before us today um, is that arbitral institutions must do more to address cybersecurity risks. Um, this motion really doesn't need any advocacy. It argues itself. Let's walk through it. There are three parts to the motion. Are there cybersecurity risks in international arbitration? Yes, unarguably. Should they be addressed? Yes, surely. What are arbitral institutions doing about these risks? With some limited exceptions like the ICDR, close to nothing. Clearly, they must do more. I'll elaborate on each of these points. Let's start with the first. It's unarguable that there are cybersecurity risks in international arbitration. We've seen highly publicized reports of data breaches. Um, you know, for example, recently it was reported that Australian institutions, including hospitals, were the target of a targeted hacking operation by a state-based state, state -based hacker. These kinds of attacks on businesses, on law firms, on arbitral institutions can have very serious financial and reputational consequences. In fact, there was a very highly publicized um, attack on the PCA's website in relation to the Philippines-China arbitration. That website was implanted with a malicious code that posed a risk to anybody visiting the website, not just to the parties, anybody visiting the website. And with the number of people involved in the arbitration with law firms, and in law firms, you have interns, paralegals, lawyers, secretaries with access to the data. You've got arbitrators, their assistants, arbitral institutions, parties, witnesses, third party providers, virtual hearing data platforms. All these are vectors of cybersecurity risk. I think we can all accept that there is a problem. What are institutions doing about it? Close to nothing. Um, most arbitral institutions do not make provision for cybersecurity issues. They do not address how vulnerable information is to be identified, how breaches are supposed to be prevented or detected, or how they're supposed to be responded to. The ICDR, of course, is one exception, and we'll talk about that in the course of our submissions. But clearly, they must do more. The one question you might want me to address is why institutions- in Oh, Jonathan, I'm not sure I want you to address it. You're running close to your three and a half minutes. We're doing a countdown now. You better begin to sum up 10. Nine, eight, so, seven, six. Arbitral institutions five, are better placed than four, tribunals and three, parties to address two, security issues. Because you're tribunals muted. Tribunals simply do not have the tools to do so. And arbitral institutions. You've just been muted, Donna, Jonathan, because you exceeded your time. This is the power of online hearings. I control the mute button. So. That, until I muted Jonathan, that was a pretty persuasive argument, Red Team. Are you simply going to concede and go home and lick your wounds, or do you have something to say about this? Who will speak for the Reds? I, I have that pleasure. So cyber risks, um, it's a pretty nebulous concept. You know, we hear about blockchain contracts, we hear about cryptocurrency, and those are also nebulous concepts. But unlike those, chances are, everybody in the audience has already been the victim of a cyber attack. Now you can check if your email's been hacked, you can see if your passwords have been put on the internet, it's real. Uh, so that we're in agreement with, with, our, with my colleagues opposite. 
Um, and if you talk to your, your firm's IT people, they will tell you there are dozens, if not hundreds of, of attacks on your firm a day. The threat is real. But what does it mean in the context of an arbitration? What does it mean to actually do something? And yes, tribunals, sorry, and yes, institutions sh should have to do something more. They have to protect themselves and they have to do some training. But when it comes down to actual cyber risks, institutions simply don't have the capacity to actually act and actually prevent or react to the risks. And I think we can see that by looking at some examples as to what actually is a cyber risk that can happen. Example one, the arbitrator opens an email one day, downloads an attachment and encrypts their computer. The nearly completed award is now no longer accessible and the threat actor is asking them to pay some amount of Bitcoins, 50,000, 100,000, in order to maybe get a code that will release their, release, um, decrypt their data and get their award back. What's the institution gonna do in that position? Risk two, an associate at a firm is tasked with making sure that a, that a provider gets paid and making sure that the money gets collected from, from the opposing counsel to also pay that provider, whether it's a hotel, uh, translator or whatnot. But the email has been hacked and an email goes out to, to the opposing counsel saying, we've changed our bank account information, Sen send your payment to this. And only months later do we realize that then nobody's actually paid the hotel, hotel venue. Nobody's paid the court reporter. Risk three. Uh, Eric, I see yeah. you're beginning to run out of time too, as well as test the patience of the arbitrators who of course have limited attention span, 10, nine, <laughs> Eight, I think the reality seven, is only the tribunal six, and the parties five, can determine what is four, needed for their case. Three, two, one, and you're muted. You know, listening to those arguments, Patricia, I'm beginning to wonder whether these teams have an appreciation of where the true cyber risks really exist. Arbitral institutions have almost no interaction in with counsel and arbitrators regarding the development of the case, regarding exchanges between the parties, regarding arbitrator communications, regarding arbitrator folders, files on the cloud, on the computer. Institutions really only maintain the ability to affect online filings and perhaps organization of hearings, which is as a proportion a quite minor amount of the time when cybersecurity events could actually crystallize. So I'd really like to have an argument from someone, uh, at least on the green side, to explain how arbitral institutions can have any impact whatsoever on the vast majority of arbitral arbitration activities. Who will speak for the greens? I'm not going to raise my hand because I don't want to fall victim to the uh, the convention, but I'll uh, I'll take this first um, first point. So I think it is um, a little bit of a of a misunderstanding of the issue to say that just because institutions don't control the server from which the arbitrator is sharing um, emails or communications about the case means that the institution can't have some influence over the way that data is dealt with by the arbitrators. Um, and there are two ways to look at this. One is within the context of cybersecurity and current guidelines, and the other is within the context of guidelines that institutions provide generally. Um, so with respect to the first, if you look at the guidelines that do exist currently for cybersecurity, many of them focus on things like educating arbitrators on how to protect their own data that is stored on their own computer, not within the server of the institution. So things like changing your password regularly, that sort of thing, you know, how, basically how to tie your shoelaces from a cybersecurity standpoint. And so the proposition's position is that um, those guidelines need to be more advanced in order to um, account for the more advanced cybersecurity risks. We're not just talking about tying your shoes, we're talking about slipping on a banana peel that a third party has thrown in the way. 
Um, and the second reason um, why, or the second way that you should look at this is in the context of guidelines that the IC, or that, that institutions like the ICDR issue uh, with respect to other topics. So for example, when you look at guidance on how to manage a hearing, the institution is not managing the hearing the same way that the institution is not managing how an arbitrator is storing files. But the institution puts out a guide that provides detailed um, uh, information and also support for arbitrator decisions on how to deal with various management problems. Oh, and so isn't, cybersecurity can isn't, be dealt with in a similar isn't, way. But isn't it a matter that the institutions want to get paid as much as possible for doing as little as possible? Do the institutions you, want to take responsibility and potential liability? Would you like me to take this one or? I think we should pass the ball. Maybe we should let Johnny has, have his last uh, 30 seconds he didn't get. I think whether or not institutions want to take on the responsibility, they already do have the responsibility. They, documents are already filed with institutions electronically, and because they are a document repository, they already have a responsibility for the information that's entrusted with them. So regardless of whether they do less or more, the responsibility is already on them. But uh, Jonathan, isn't that only for a small portion of the activity? Meredith is suggesting that an arbitral institution can govern my conduct as an arbitrator with best practices guidelines and no ability to enforce those guidelines with respect to my treatment of data on my system. Uh, that seems to me like an easy hit out of the park response on the part of the red team. Yulia, are you just gonna let them go silent on that? Not point out the obvious weakness of that kind of argument? Um, it's obvious that the institutions do not have the power to enforce any rules that they may set. They cannot uh, deal with any hacks that have happened. They cannot impose any uh, penalties on the parties or the arbitrator. The, 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 the only thing the institutions can do is provide some guidance. It is really for the parties to control the process, to enforce the, the rules, the, the, the tribunal to enforce the rules. So it really is... Yeah, but, 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 but if you say it's up to the parties. How often do you find the parties have exactly the same idea and the same budget and are able to agree on these pretty technical and detailed logistics? And, and do you think that grandpa and grandma arbitrator are going to be able to guide in this? No, it will be, uh, the emphasis will be on the parties to agree, but equally, if you have a set of rules imposed um, on the parties by an institution, that do the same parties come into the institution with the same difficulties and the same inequality. So the, that issue will be there regardless of who's setting the rules or who's enforcing them. But, but is it, is it, isn't Sorry, it a matter ahead, isn't it a matter of trying to find a, a, the appropriate solutions for the particular case? Is there some kind of guidelines that can provide any real uh, helpfulness by having a one size fits all approach? We cannot have a one size fits all approach for all arbitrations. They're all too different. The, 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 too different in terms of uh, scale of the arbitration, the number of parties, the, uh, the equality of arms is different. That's why each party has to, each of the two parties have to come together and decide what uh, um, cyber security measures they're going to have in place for that particular arbitration. Yulia, you are assuming a great deal of cooperation between two sides that adamantly dislike each other. The parties certainly, and by midway through any arbitration, often counsel. I mean, they counsel on one side, and parties on one side don't have any expectation that they'll be responsible for the cybersecurity of the opponent, the other side. And arbitrators, especially independent arbitrators like me, simply don't have the necessary infrastructure or expertise to do that. Uh, aren't, isn't your approach simply a recipe for unilateral conduct by each side with no ability to test and enforce? Well, I would disagree. There are guidelines um, out there already available for parties to use as a baseline and then come to an agreement. And 
parties do have to come to an agreement already, for example, in procedural orders, the initial procedural order. So um, a level of cooperation has, uh, is already there. We, uh, this is not the only thing that the parties will have to agree on during the course of the proceedings. Colleagues of the opposition uh, just mentioned the baseline, uh, and that's precisely our point. No, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for every arbitration. Uh, but there are commonalities and baseline measures that should be adopted by arbitrations. And the, the proposition's um, uh, submission is that arbitral institutions should be the ones developing what those baseline uh, measures uh, of mandatory implementation should be. Obviously, there is still room for the parties to collaborate and increase or amend uh, if they come to agreement, uh, but some baseline must exist. Expecting the parties to negotiate every aspect of a cybersecurity protocol um, that will impose obligations not only on the parties, but also on the arbitral tribunal and also with respect to the arbitral institution is impracticable. There are a lot of technical issues that the parties, their counsel, and even the arbitrators do not have the expertise to address. So the, all of the parties converge in um, administrator arbitrations in the arbitral institution. So the arbitral institution is the one that's best positioned to take on that lead and develop what those minimum baselines should be. Oh, now wait a minute, Claudia. So your expectation then is that an arbitral institution is not only going to establish a guideline for what kind of systems I should have as an arbitrator, and what kind of experience and practice I should have as an arbitrator. But they're going to hold me accountable by throwing me off their list if it turns out I have an older computer and I don't have sufficient cybersecurity connections. Mark, Mark, Mark I can tell you that uh, one of our, um, in our chat, Linda, uh, Laura Zimmerman suggests that an institute should require arbitrators to disclose about their cybersecurity measures, and that they should require arbitrators to have at least baseline uh, competence in order to even be confirmed. Well, does anybody agree or disagree with that proposal by Laura? Come now, someone could surely speak up to it. I expect the Greens would rather like it because they want arbitral institutions to intervene in my life quite heavily. And the Reds think that's probably quite impracticable. Someone's who's got to buy the E and who's got to buy the E and O for this? The institute or the arbitrators? No, I think Laura's idea is a great idea. Pity no institutions doing it. They clearly should take it up. They clearly should do more. And it illustrates a structural problem. If arbitrators are the ones that are the cause of a cybersecurity breach, I'm not sure it's a good so good solution to say parties and arbitrators can just sort it out between themselves because parties and the tribunal are not in an equal position once a dispute has arisen. Parties cannot easily um, negotiate with arbitrators on the rules that they have to comply with. An institution is much better place to do that. Carolina Morandi asks us if the responsibility is going to be pushed to the parties or burden the arbitrators, then what's the point of having an institutional arbitration and paying those fees? Why not just use an ad hoc? I think the uh, Greens have to try to answer that. Uh, I, I think our position is that we absolutely agree with that. Um, the, the institution, part of its role is to manage the arbitration. And maybe, you know, 20, 25 years ago, um, that required shuffling paper uh, and, you know, um, helping distribute things around the world physically. Now that involves management of data and it involves um, you know, some of the management of the arbitral proceeding involves managing the arbitrators. And it's, um, you know, uh, we, we see a similar example, um, not to bring in another institution, but under the ICC rules um, in order to manage costs, because that's an issue where it's difficult for parties to negotiate with arbitrators on their costs, particularly after the dispute has begun. And so the ICC has penalties now in place as of 2019 um, to uh, encourage arbitrators to comply with efficiency and cost goals. Okay, wait, wait, so you're, talking, you're talking about cost, Meredith. Do you, do you suggest that in a complex arbitration where there's a lot of sensitive information and a lot of information being distributed, 
and the cost of cybersecurity will be high, if the Arbitrator Institute is going to have to shoulder some of that responsibility, are those all costs that should be shifted to the parties? And maybe the parties might say, we don't want that level of cybersecurity, it's too expensive. And the Institute will say, yes, but Meredith and Jonathan and Claudia have burdened us with ensuring that we meet this level. Well, this is why we recommend that institutions lay down a baseline, um, a, a, a general guideline that is formed by um, their systematic approach to cybersecurity issues and the economies of scale that give them better education. Um, but then those uh, cybersecurity um, guidelines can be adapted for the particular arbitration. And yes, in some cases, there might be a higher cost. So the default cost of a more expensive arbitration will be higher, assuming that the cybersecurity risks will also be higher. Um, but as we know from uh, things uh, from various uh, times when we've had to negotiate with the institution, for example, about the number and appointment method of appointment of arbitrators um, or about other um, issues in our arbitration clauses, um, the institutions can gener generally be flexible, um, subject to parties being able to agree, to agree. The issue is having a default, something that's there in case the parties cannot agree, so that you have some basic level of protection instead of just a wild west. So your position, Meredith, then, is that the arbitral institutions should be willing to raise their rates to cover not only the out-of-pocket costs of introducing more cybersecurity intervention, but also the liability risk they necessarily incur by trying to regulate cybersecurity for the parties, the council, and the arbitrators. Francisco, I think that's a gimme for you. Are you just going to sit there silent and let the moderators make your arguments for you? Well, no, but I mean, there's nothing more, there's not much to say on that. I mean, it's just, you cannot impose some institutions so much. I mean, I, we, I, I think everyone here has conceded that there must be a baseline, but uh, you can, the institution cannot be asked to go above and beyond that baseline. Well, why not? They have uh, waivers of immunity in their rules. I'm sorry, they, they have immunity in their rules and jurisprudence in every leading arbitral jurisdiction that I know of confirms that arbitral institutions get the same immunity as arbitrators. So why shouldn't arbitral institutions take on that risk? After all, arbitrators don't have the capacity to do that and counsel and parties don't have the immunity. Correct. Right. However, the, uh, I mean, the again, the there's no one size fits all for all arbitrations. And then if we have a higher standard and impose it on the parties who don't want it, that would be an issue. And second, if the part, I mean, normally, as you said, the parties will not reach an agreement, but that's why we have the tribunal who will probably hear both parties' arguments on, on the need in the standards for cybersecurity and then have the tribunal issue a decision on procedure order number one. So most arbitrators uh, are rather senior in age because that's how you end up being an arbitrator after you've demonstrated in your career that you are trustworthy or you can fool people into believing you're trustworthy. And those are the ones who are least likely to have the cyber capacity to make those decisions. Would you trust me consultant. to decide on, oh, so now I should hire a consultant and put that no. charge to the parties as well? I mean, come Not now, Francisco. Not necessarily, but the ICVR is providing courses, right? So uh, if you Have want- Have you taken one of those courses, Francisco? Not yet. Continue, Francisco. Sorry, Louise. Um, if I can interject. Um... You better, because Francisco is sitting there grinning. <laughs> the parties in the tribunal are not the best position to adopt these measures and agree to these measures or, or order what measures should be taken into account. Um, once there's a dispute, normally um, procedural disputes, um, each party uh, adopts a position that will strategically advantage that party, not necessarily serve to the best purposes or the integrity of the arbitration as a whole. Cybersecurity measures are not meant to be strategic issues, they're meant to be security issues. So the parties have misaligned incentives uh, as to the positions they take and will not necessarily work collaboratively. Also, cybersecurity measures would also apply to the tribunal, 
So there's a misaligned incentive there because basically what the tribunal and the arbitrators are saying is going to apply to the parties, they're saying is going to apply to themselves. So that could um, increase costs to the arbitrators, um, for example. So no, they are not uh, in the best position to make these determinations. Again, the arbitral institution is the one that should be making these uh, baseline decisions. And then if additional needs uh, are present, uh, the parties can negotiate something else. Oh, Eric, how can you sit yeah. there and let her argue, make yeah. that argument? I think the reality is we all know the weakest link on the cybersecurity chain is the human element. And it it's, might sound very nice and good to have the institution establish fancy guidelines and rules and principles, but it comes down to what can the arbitrators do? What are they comfortable with? And you can have a fancy, fancy setup, but if the arbitrator is just going to take that email, take that document, and put it on their domestic, their, their at-home USB key, or leave it at a coffee shop, it doesn't matter if you have those high things. So the reality is you need to talk to the arbitrators, agree between the parties, counsel and the arbitrators, what are we actually doing? What are we comfortable doing? What steps can we take that we'll all actually comply with? And not just draft a 50 page piece of paper about the principles that maybe we can take or should take. So this just quickly gets us back to Johnny's point from earlier, which is who is best placed to negotiate with arbitrators and convince them to do something that they're not entirely comfortable with. So if you have a recalcitrant arbitrator who says, no, I've used Gmail for the last 10 years and I'm gonna use Gmail until the day I die, then you may not be able to negotiate with that person in order to take any cybersecurity product or any cybersecurity um, uh, steps. And so the institution, which actually has some sort of sway over the arbitrator and moreover doesn't have any skin in the game when it comes to the dispute, is much better placed to have that conversation with that person. But the institution also has much less knowledge of what's going on, doesn't it? I mean, after all, so much of what happens in an arbitration happens outside the electronic or paper record that the institution sees. You know, aren't you asking the one participant in the arbitration who has the least involvement to make the hardest decision? I think there's um, two. I'll, I'll oh. mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's two points there. One, I think it is not an excuse for arbitrators to say that they don't have the knowledge and the skill set to deal with cybersecurity. Arbitrators need to uh, learn and uh, improve and uh, get up to speed with the, with the current world. Well, you really overestimate the ability and the willingness of some arbitrators to say that they need to learn and they need to up their game. Some of the arbitrators may say, I'm sitting as an arbitrator because the parties have complete confidence in my ability and I'm getting sufficient appointments and I don't see any reason to go back and sit with those uh, ICDR Y and I kids in the classroom. But if the parties have a, um, a real concern about security risks, they may choose not to appoint those arbitrators who have no consideration for security. They may impact the, their wallets eventually, so they will have to learn how to adapt. And um, the second point is that, um, yes, the law firms and the lawyers themselves invest uh, uh, very heavily into cybersecurity uh, protocols and protection measures because we have to do that on a daily basis with all the uh, documentation, all the materials that we have. So we are best placed to, um, to enforce and to set the, uh, the standard for that arbitration because we are doing it on a daily basis anyway, and we are dealing with the majority part of the arbitration process. How, how are you, if, it's one thing to say, and you got a lot of people to agree with you that arbitral institutes ought to do more, but how are you going to actually get arbitral institutes across the globe to be willing to invest in, pay for, and implement, and shoulder this pretty broad responsibility? Isn't it kind of a la-la land proposition you've come with? And just for the they record, agree. that was a good movie. Go ahead, Jonathan. 
I think we might disagree on that. But <laughs> um, the institutions, I think, in, have an incentive in their enlightened self-interest to take on that investment. I think it differentiates them from the competition. They are ultimately commercial creatures in the marketplace for arbitration. And if you're like the ICDR and you've got cybersecurity best practices requiring arbitrators to undergo training, and suddenly a pandemic hits and all hearings are moved online, and then instead of just documents and requests for arbitration being in people's mailboxes, you also have testimony embedded in these deep sea cables that carry out the net. And that testimony is also now also vulnerable. In a situation like this, an institution that takes it on itself to address cybersecurity has clearly got a comparative advantage to its competitors. I think there is a huge case for enlightened self-interest here. And especially when they raise their rates to reflect their taking on that task. That's certainly persuasive. Um, just before we move over to the red team to talk about that, I just want to remind the audience that if you want to get some questions in, we're coming closer to the end. So you might use the Q&A if you want us to raise any questions. Yulia, do you really think Jonathan's argument is persuasive there? No. <laughs> uh, simply, uh, I just think that uh, institutions are not equipped to deal with these um, with all cybersecurity issues on all arbitral uh, matters. Um, it is uh, the responsibility of the, the parties, the responsibility of the lawyers to protect um, uh, the information. And um, it is, we need to be the ones who are controlling the process and enforcing it and asking the tribunal uh, members to uh, assist us with that. It is not for the institutions to impose additional level of rules and invest in, into that. Um, it's just not workable. But I, I wonder for, for the, prop, the proposition side, do you really want to entrust your client's cybersecurity in a sensitive, high value case to the staff of an arbitral institute secretariat that oftentimes is manned by relatively young lawyers with little experience and probably no technical special training or awareness. Wouldn't you rather say, my client will engage a tech specialist company to assess and deal with our needs? Do you really want those young lawyers in the institutes to take responsibility for your clients' cybersecurity and your law firm's cybersecurity. I, I think that's a good example, Patricia. I think when we're saying institutions should do more, we're not saying that they should secure all this data themselves. We're saying they should do more to deal with the Wild West we've got, where there's no clear, there's no clear agreement with the norms. So in a situation like you've mentioned, I think an institution could, for example, have a rule saying all file should be on a secure platform. And maybe there's a default, maybe the default's an institution, but parties and arbitrators could agree to or decide on a different platform, but at least whichever way you go, there is a secure platform. I think that you should do is set, set some baseline rules that parties can add to if they want to. Yeah, so in addition to that, they already are. So one thing is the full enforcement of the cybersecurity measures. And the a second thing is what the guides are going to be and then everybody has to adopt them and enforce them. Um, the arbitral institution is already entrusted with whatever sensitive information are in the case files. So they already have that responsibility and they need to take measures. As Jonathan was saying, what we are asking arbitral institutions to do is to adopt those baseline or, or establish those baseline rules so that all of the players have a minimum that they must meet and they can agree to higher standards. Um, it's not that the arbitral institution is gonna get into my particular server and-, and I know, these anything. green guys keep saying they, the arbitral institute should do more and they should have some baseline guides. That to me sounds like it's a really cushy, soft way for the institutes to window dress and still leave the responsibility to the parties. And Laura Zimmerman is helping out you, 
um, the, the opponents, she suggests that maybe all of you ICDR, YNI young lawyers ought to start encouraging drafting arbitration agreements, which actually insert some requirements regarding cybersecurity responsibility. What about that? Has she helped you out, Francisco, Eric, and Yulia? I think so. You know, we, we see arbitration clauses talking about confidentiality. Cybersecurity is simply the next step of confidentiality. And whether that then means we need to interpret confidentiality in the arbitration clause to include a mandate to the panel um, to, to address this issue, um, or whether we need to actually uh, augment the clause to do something else, is a bit, you know, neither here nor there. The obligation is there once you have that confidentiality obligation. But uh, Eric, confidentiality is an issue that hasn't really changed much over the decades. On the other hand, cybersecurity, the velocity of technological change in the area of cyber, digital, virtual, even hard copy is enormous. Keeping up with the technological changes and the security required for that changes every single day. Doesn't that mean that an arbitration agreement couldn't have anything more than generalities in it, in joining the arbitrator and the parties to think deeply about cybersecurity? But if the contract in question is going to last more than 90 days, you can't really write it to address whatever Jonathan meant by his phrase, a secure platform, because we have no idea what will be a secure platform 180 days from now. Zoom has certainly changed all by itself just in the last three months. And, and in, indeed, um, the contract can say, you know, the party shall ensure that data, is, that data meets privacy legislation, uh, shall meet, you know, the current standard of the art in terms of cybersecurity. And it's then left up to the tribunal to decide what that is. And we know tribunals are quite capable of hearing complex disputes on technical issues and making decisions. This is simply all yet tribunals. Wow. Well, you, you know, I think it's fascinating as this is, I think we really need to have closing statements now. Uh, and then we can go to Patricia's polling. So I, I would invite someone bold on the green side to come up with a closing statement. And then I would find someone formidable on the red side to come up with their closing statement. Let's start with the greens. Increase in frequency of cyber attacks, coupled with the harsh consequences of security breaches, should make data protection and cybersecurity a top priority for all stakeholders holders in international um, arbitration. Um, as has been um, said during this debate, each custodian in the arbitral process represents a target for cyber attackers. And um, the cybersecurity measures are only as strong as the weakest of those custodians. In administered arbitrations, the point of convergence between the participants will generally be the arbitral institution um, and their document repositories. Um, thus, in addition to their obligation to secure the data they receive, arbitral institutions have an interest in ensuring that everyone who is involved and arbitral proceedings protects its data adequately. Currently, if cybersecurity is addressed at all, um, arbitral institutions gently nudge participants to consider cybersecurity issues and leave it to the parties and arbitrators to determine what measures are appropriate based on the particular circumstances of each case. However, as we've discussed, expecting the parties to negotiate each component of a cybersecurity protocol that will impose obligations on the tribunal, on arbitral institutions, and the parties themselves after the dispute um, has arisen is impracticable. Most parties and arbitrators simply lack the experience required and um, knowledge required to properly assess cybersecurity risks and implement um, corresponding cybersecurity measures. To be effective, Cybersecurity measures must apply to the arbitrators as well as the parties and the arbitral institution. This is normally achieved not by procedural orders that the tribunal would rule upon, but by rules 
uh, that the administrative uh, institution, the arbitral institution, would adopt. If it were left to the tribunals, there may be misaligned incentives when deciding what measures to order. And if the measures are open to the parties and the tribunals, um, they would not address systematically baseline cybersecurity risks that are inherent generally in arbitration. Because of their expertise, their structure, and the scale, what the proponents um, propose is that arbitral institutions are uniquely positioned to identify and address those systemic cybersecurity risks. And even acknowledging that there is no one size fits all solution, um, arbitral institutions should devise protocols and rules to address those baseline cybersecurity risks. Um, arbitral institutions have always led the way. Uh, this is nothing new. As was the case with issues like emergency arbitrators, ethical issues, arbitral institutions have been at the forefront of change and they should um, be at the forefront of change now in setting the cybersecurity standards in international arbitration. A powerful statement. Red team, can you match it or exceed it? Hopefully. Well, the first point here, uh, the proposition is supposed to be that arbitral institutions should do more to secure or to have a cyber secure proceeding. However, uh, the, pro the proponents, the only thing that, the only point that they made and they considered was that the only thing they should be, that the, there's, there only should be a baseline, a minimum. And that's what, it, and that's what we've seen that institutions have done so far. The ICDR has guidelines, a checklist, and even, uh, recommends that arbitrators take the course. Whether the arbitrators like the courses or not, that's a different question. And uh, the, the arbitrators can, and one thing that we cannot, there are two obligations that we cannot deny here. The first one is the parties. The council has an obligation to protect the parties, the, the client's information. That is professional responsibility 101 anywhere in the world. Second, the, the, the arbitral tribunal has the obligation to protect the integrity of the proceedings. That would include cybersecurity here. So now another issue is, or basically what we're talking about is this La La Land proposition that an institution that has immunity should take care of cybersecurity in, in the ones that don't have the immunity, the ones that have the actual obligation to protect uh, the client's information should just leave it to the leave it to the institution that is again immune. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. The institution indeed has to maybe provide some guidelines in a minimum. Other than that, that would be unworkable, and that is a, the party's responsibility. And the, the idea that we could do it in that we can do it in, in the arbitration agreement uh, that that is a great proposition. I mean, that's actually be, uh, being accountable as attorneys uh, to our regarding our duty to protect the client's information. Uh, and then the tribunal, of course, has the power to enforce the party's will. And even, and even, if, the, and even if it's not in the agreement, in the end, the tribunal has the, has the power and the obligation to enforce uh, or to order the parties to protect such information and to take the adequate measures. So here the moderators have the power and the authority. Patricia, would you care to run the final poll? You should unmute yourself, Patricia. Thank you. The poll is now out. So we're in progress. We're going to say, wow, wow, wow. Disagree. Oh, I disagree might come up a little bit more. Oh, it's still overwhelmingly agree. But I actually think that you have changed some people's minds. Yes, the percentages are looking better for the disagree. Wow, you have changed some opinions here. Okay, we're gonna close it down in five seconds. Your last chance to vote is coming up. Here we go. Couple more votes coming in. Disagree, your last chance to grab a vote. Okay, ending the polling and sharing the results. Congratulations to the disagree who managed to get, garner more votes than they had before. So I think we've now reached the stage where our debaters have exhausted themselves and the topics. And I think it's time for Raphael to take us home. 
on behalf of the ICBR YNI. Would you please, Rafael? Of course, no. Um, I want to thank everyone once again uh, for joining and for this very interesting debate, also to uh, you know the moderators and the debaters. Uh, I just want to say also one second, I will not bore you with any details, but if you're curious uh, about uh, you know, what we do in terms of cybersecurity and data privacy, uh, if you just post it in the chat, it uh, should be available to everyone, uh, a link to um, you know, our website that explains a little bit more our efforts in that regard. And uh, trust me, we do, you know, as uh, employees of AAA ACDR, we've received uh, training on these issues and uh, we raised them with the parties in our initial call as well as in our initial correspondence. And uh, as it's been mentioned already, uh, we are, you know, preparing courses for the arbitrators and we're running them already on cybersecurity. So uh, it's certainly something that we take uh, very seriously and uh, we are really trying to. Uh, you know, take into account and improve every day on that. So uh, with that, again, thank you all very much uh, for joining us today. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yep.